Hello, my name is engineer Elizabeth Rogo. I'm an oil and gas engineer based in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm also the founder and CEO of Savo Oilfield Services. We're a technical premier consulting firm dealing in the energy space, specifically in oil and gas. I'm also passionate about women in the energy sector, particularly the African woman. And this is my story. Welcome to the CEO Bench. My name is Eddie O'Killa. And on this episode of the CEO Bench, we have the Iron Lady. She is the queen of oil and gas sector, as we refer to her. And she's seen it all, done it all, been around the world, been around the rigs, the oil rigs, offshore, onshore, and now back in East Africa to make the African girl shine. Ladies and gentlemen, with me is the engineer herself, engineer Elizabeth Rogo, all the way from Nairobi, Kenya in East Africa, into Kampala. And we've been having a very interesting conversation over the oil and gas, Uganda International Oil and Gas Summit in Kampala. And we decided to catch up and talk to Elizabeth about who is actually Elizabeth. And I will start this from a lighter note, Elizabeth. Who is Elizabeth? Elizabeth is a proud African first proud African woman. I'm Kenyan by birth. The daughter of a very strong mother who unfortunately passed on two years ago, Ambassador Oriye Rogo Manduli, and uh, the daughter of a brilliant scientist, my father, John Jeremiah Ondieki, who passed on a few months ago. I feel I'm the daughter of, of the soil. And as you said, I'm here in Uganda, and you've been trying to get to lock me <laughs> down, and you've finally done it yeah. after what I think was a, a very good Uganda oil and gas um, summit. I think number four, number eight, sorry. Number eight. Yeah, number eight. And I can't remember how many I've, I've done. <laughs> but I have always yeah. participated where I can. So it's very nice to be back in Uganda. It's a bit humid, I have to say. Uh, but I love Uganda. As you know, Uganda was my home from 2011 to 2013, when you were exploring for oil, with Tala Oil. So for me, it's wonderful to see what is happening, the progress that's being made, and to see more Ugandans getting into this field, and especially uh, engineers, seeing more technical people, and obviously more entrepreneurs. As you know, I'm very, very, um, I, I love entrepreneurs, whether they're technical or not. Wow. Well, I mean, it's, it's been a long journey trying to get to speak. And we want to start from another note of just knowing you from childhood, growing up as an African child. Did you grow up in Africa? Did you grow up in Nairobi, in yes. Kenya, or in the Luo land? Where, 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 where do we start this journey from? I started this journey from Nairobi, the city. Um, so my parents uh, were divorced, so we were raised by our mother. And uh, we were very lucky we came from a home where education was the big thing. She always said, if I'm going to give you something, it's going to be education. And we all loved education. Uh, I have three sisters, uh, one sister who unfortunately also passed on about a year and a half ago, Alison. And I have Janice, who's also with me in, um, in the oil sector. Actually works for uh, the pipeline, Kenya Pipeline in, in Nairobi. As most kids, I grew up thinking that I'm going to be a doctor. So everything for me was medicine. This all changed when I was in university in Canada. Um, studied, studied my first degree and I met a, a professor, Dr. Nick Hill, who encouraged me to go to the environmental side. And with that, I ended up with a consulting company in Halifax, Nova Scotia, called SNC Lavalin. And in that consultancy, or rather in that internship, is where I got to know about the oil and gas. Um, industry. And long story short, I found myself in um, Houston, Texas, and started my first foray in oil and gas proper with a well-known company called BJ Services. And that was the beginning of my journey into the oil and gas sector. Wow. I want to take you a little bit back to the formative years of uh, growing up as an African child. Did you ever see yourself 
where you are today and what was the experience like growing up as an African child in your time? Uh, yes, I did. As I said, I had a, I would say my mother was um, somebody who really molded me. But did I see myself in an energy sector? No. It's so funny, I was thinking about this a few years back, that as a child, I remember sitting in an airport with my mother in a VIP lounge in Nairobi. And there was this gentleman that sat next to me and he started talking. And I remember him having a bag that we used to carry when we worked offshore. And I remember him talking about, I'm traveling, I've traveled. I think he was coming from Angola. I was very young then. And it just sounded fascinating. And this was a memory that somehow got locked or stored and never thought about it until, you know, as I said, my, my being in this field, that suddenly this memory came back that I met this man who embodied what I, I'm, I am today and what I was doing. So it's, it's very fascinating because obviously there was nobody that I knew that, that was doing what I was doing. Most of the people in my family were either doctors, lawyers, politicians and teachers uh, and so on, you know. So I'd say in my family, I'm the first engineer as a woman and also first in the oil, oil field service sector. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud about it. Let's talk about your parents. When parents are raising children, uh, they always have a certain liking of where they want these children to be. And you talked about your mom, you know, um, obviously she's a well-known woman in East Africa. And not to mention I would say, how... I would say Af Afri <laughs> Africa and the world. Africa, yes, yes. yes she, she's mm -hmm. known in East Africa as, yes. as, as a powerful lady who was in, um, who, who, who embraced the sport taken, you know, by men. Yes. Uh, she, she's uh, credited being the first uh, Kenyan woman into the Kenya East Safari. East Africa East Safari, Safari Rally. East Africa Safari yes. Rally, yes, yes. yes. I, I suppose she wanted you to be something else. How did you navigate your way from what your mother wanted to where the path was taken? She was a diplomat, she took the path, and then you ended up completely somewhere else. Did yeah, you disappoint her? No, not at all. Mom <laughs> was ex extremely proud. Yeah. Um, and I think through her, through her, through her journey, yeah. as you said, in, in the political realm, in the bus business realm, in entrepreneur, she was a, a big farmer, and that's how she left us as a big farmer. Yeah. We were able to watch her. Now, obviously, being children of parents that are known and have done very well, one of the things she always said was, create your own path. And I'm very grateful. So we've never had to, you know, hang on her skirt to be who we are. Uh, but we're obviously very, very proud to always mention, you know, you know where we where we come from. Yes. Okay. And let's talk about your dad. What was his contribution to this? What 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 he 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 was a scientist, according to yes, you. Yes. Yes. And obviously, we know that you wanted to be a scientist, which means you had influence at some point from him. But you didn't become a scientist in that context. That's he most probably wanted following his footpath. And sometimes parents feel disappointed that, I mean, this was supposed to follow my path and this has not happened. Did you ever have a conversation with your dad about this and how was the feeling like? Well, as I said, my parents divorced when I was very young, I think age seven. And I look exactly like him. Uh, apparently I'm a carbon copy <laughs> of him, uh, yeah. the female form. Yeah. Um, no, my dad, I, I would say later in life, uh, later on in life is where we really began to have a conversation. And he, he was very proud uh, of what I was doing, especially, you know, when I started entering into the board, the board levels, and obviously was always interested, do we really have oil? Do we have oil? And uh, would be interested in knowing, you know, you know the travels and, and what I'm seeing. So yes, in his own way, he was very excited. Um, I did want bef before, oh yeah, I told you I wanted to be a doctor, yeah. but then uh, later on I wanted to go into agriculture. But I thought to myself, is there money in agriculture? Because <laughs> as I said, my mother was a farmer and we yeah. saw a lot of times when farming could be, could be very difficult, you know. Yeah. But if it was still doing farming and still doing what I'm doing in the oil and gas sector, or let me correct myself here, yeah. energies. We are now moving into what we call the energy. So when we start talking about what I'm doing in the company, you can see it's not just an oil and gas um, scenario. I want to know, SN2, uh, before uh, we take this break, and take you to just one more question. And that question would be about leadership. 
What is your understanding of leadership and how do you define leadership, Elizabeth? Ah, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, and the way I see lead, leadership is uh, you're a person um, that encourages, that emboldens people. You are able to set a clear path. And within, being that, within the leadership, you're also able to listen and embody what others are trying to tell you as you create a vision and a path. I think also by being a leader, I don't expect everyone to be like me. I think a leader also is somebody who's able to value what each person then brings to the table. So I think a leader really crystallizes maybe a particular road, a particular process, um, a particular pathway. I think that's what a, a leader is. And a leader is somebody who is also able to step back and allow others others to shine, maybe in areas that they never thought that they had. I think that's really what makes a leader. And a leader is not a be-all, end-all. And I think as women, I think women somehow tap into that, especially on the emotional level. I think we are very good at um, coming from the oil and gas sector. Uh, as a woman leader, I really try to impart to, for, you know, to, to women that there is a strength you must allow yourself yet still remain that femininity is, is there, but do not be afraid to expose that strength as a woman. And I always tell people that working with men has been some of the best experience for me because it also taught me how to manage my emotions, how to think maybe more critically um, and how to crystallize and how then to be able to work across you know, across the, the gender line. But coming back to what you said, a leader allows everyone, I think, raises everyone to their level to be able to lead. Wow. Well, Elizabeth, we're going to take a break. And when we come back from this break, we would want you to define leadership from an Elizabeth perspective. What is leadership to you? And after that, we'll dive into your leadership journey, your personal journey from where you started where you are now and where you're heading to. You're watching the CEO Bench with Elizabeth, engineer Elizabeth Rogo, all the way from Nairobi in Kampala, Uganda. And of course, depending on where you're watching from, we'll take a break and when we come back, we'll continue with this conversation. This is the CEO Bench. <music> Welcome back from the break. My name is Edu Kila, and this is the CEO Bench. In the studio with me is engineer Elizabeth Rogo, all the way from Nairobi, Kenya, in Kampala, and on the CEO Bench, where we get to talk about things that matters to leaders. And if you're looking for inspiration, where to start from, you know, learning from people who have been there, done that, and are moving, Elizabeth is one of those people who you want to find the inspiration from to start your journey moving forward. And now this part of the show, we're going to be talking about the personal journey starting from leadership to how to change and manage change. Elizabeth, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, we talked about leadership mm -hmm. already. And I want us to pick up from what is leadership in your own context. If you are to define it in one minute, or in, 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 in five words or in one word, what would you say? And how did that influence your decision to pick yourself and to start? Basically, your personal journey as a leader. So I'll pick up from my personal journey as a leader because I don't want to give you a, a textbook definition. Anyone can go and find it. Yeah. Um, did I know I had a leadership in me? I think uh, in some form or fashion I did. I considered myself to be a little bit shy when I was uh, younger. Uh, but I guess I was more vocal than I thought. And this came, you know, obviously with age. I was always very curious and always wanted to put myself out there uh, when questions or, or opportunities raised themselves. Um, I wasn't necessarily scared to make mistakes. I'm a big believer that it's through mistakes that you learn, but you don't also want to do too many mistakes that it negates. Uh, what, what you're doing. As I started my journey in, in oil and gas, this was a very, as you know, very male-oriented yes. uh, sector. Yeah. 
And so I had to be able to find my space. So I always believe that leadership doesn't necessarily mean my title needs to say I'm a manager. But in just my scope, I was always trying to be the leader. So I eventually became the lead engineer in the jobs we're doing, you know, onshore. Then, a, you know, become a region engineer. So you're, you're leading, then move on to, you know, business, this business segment, sales and marketing. And I know you like, you like marketing. So in that way, trying to build, as I said, the, the leadership. The thing, the thing that surprised me was, did I ever expect to start a company? That surprised me. And, and I want to just pick up from that point. A lot of us struggle with self-leadership. Yes. And from what you've just explained, it appears that you started to practice self-leadership from a very early age. And coming from a very strong background of a woman who picked herself and took herself to a male-dominated space and owned it. And today she's known in Africa as a lady who was refined in that space. The personal journey is not an easy one for most people. No, no, it's not. And defining that moment to say, I need to start doing this is not easy for people. Would you share your experience of how you actually picked up to yourself? What was the journey like? I told you I started my oil and gas in Canada, then moved to the US. Um, and I first started in the marketing division. That's why I never poo -poo marketing. So I'm here as an engineer sitting in what was marketing division for US Mexico. Um, I was able to observe an area of the oil and gas industry that I really didn't know. It was called oil field services. And I was sorry, I was interacting with um, very high level people up to the president and providing reports. So I was able to say, to ask myself, when will I ever get to that level? What does it take for someone like me to get to that level? Well, I'm a foreigner. I'm a woman. I didn't necessarily look at my, my dark skin or my Africanness as being a barrier, but more so I'm a woman and I'm not seeing women like me up in the higher stratosphere. I remember uh, one sales manager, um, I decided I wanted to go purely into sales. So I went to the region sales manager for US in the company that I was at and I said, look, I would like to apply. I'm actually an engineer, I've done my time in marketing and I think I have something to contribute and he took one look at me and he said no you, you cannot come <laughs> here and I said why yeah. and he said um, because most of us have come out of the field you need to understand what happens on the ground to be able to sell the products and services I walked out of there fuming saying what a racist man he was but do you know if I were to ever see him again I'd give him the biggest hug because he was the impetus. I said, okay, you want me to go into the field? I will go into the field. So I left a very cushy office in Houston and moved into the field. Now, everyone, my colleagues were all laughing, thinking that this is just a phase. Uh, my boss also thought in one year's time, I'll be back. And I'm still in touch with my lovely boss, Bruce, Bruce Bricko, wherever you are now. And um, the rest is history. I went into this fascinating area and I said, I've got to make a name and a way. Mm -hmm. And the name didn't necessarily mean I'm going to be a president, but just to be able to say, look, a foreign woman can come here and make an impact. And you cannot make an impact by yourself. You have to have people that help you in that journey as well. So I was always very good with networking, always very good to talk to other people besides my bosses. And, and ask them, what is, it, what is it that you did? Because everyone's journey is different, but you can pick up on certain areas. So I was fortunate through a, a mentor um, who passed away a few years ago, Rudy de Groot, and I like to mention people's names, they're not just people, you know. Rudy de Groot called me into another company. Another, this is now the third largest oil field service company. And that's what started my journey into the international space. So as a region engineer. And for me, Africa was always the big thing. So I did a bit of offshore in the US, did a lot of stuff on land, went and lived in Aberdeen, and then was a region engineer for projects, West Africa. And specifically, Equatorial Guinea, sitting on, on ships, the only woman. <laughs> so of course, I loved it. Yeah, I was always, yeah, you know, yeah, everyone, yeah. Everybody, yeah. everyone knew me from yeah. there. Yeah. And so um, I again just worked my way. 
uh, ended up in um, Angola, and Angola was very, very tough, very tough environment. But I used to feel proud when I'd see men. Tough because of you being Everything. a woman? No, it, just, it was overly a tough, at that time, it was a tough environment. Um, um, okay, for me it was tough because I saw a lot of poverty at that time. Okay. Yeah, and here you are. Uh, remember, I'm working as an expatriate. Yeah. Yes, and Angola at that time was uh, where a lot of money was. So I used to kind of have this imposter syndrome or guilt, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, but then I realized, yeah, yes, okay, yes, look, yeah. it's my journey, okay? I have all these white men around me and I'm the few. And of course, uh, I was very fortunate. I got a, a wonderful boss from Nigeria, Tokes Aziz, and we're still very good friends. And um, these were the people who then guided me. But, you know, let me tell you something. I always knew I was going to come back to Africa in some form or fashion. I always knew I was going to contribute. I didn't know exactly where. Um, I left, there was no oil and gas sitting in Kenya, nothing in Uganda. You know, nobody was talking about that. East Africa. No, but, so it's either going to be a Nigeria and an Angola, you know, so basically uh, West Coast, okay? But I didn't know much about those places either until I started working. Then you start hearing, okay, Tala Oil has come to Uganda and you're like, oh, I'd like to go to Uganda. And they're like, no, Liz, you're not a drilling engineer. I, 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 um, my area is in frac, what we call fra hydraulic fracture engineer, engineering. And I'd be like, OK, so when, when will it be time for me to move to East Africa? You know, <laughs> then I switched companies. So this is the last company that um, actually brought me into East Africa. They scouted me. They found me and um, uh, they brought me in. So I was like, ah. I'm now in East Africa. My first entry point was Kampala. And let me get, let me get personal here. <laughs> so I come to Kampala yes, and I'm yes. thinking, hey, this place is so dead. I'm not going to cope. I didn't know about the, you know, the big, the big uh, social disco the, seeds yeah, or whatever. Yeah, let me the not big use social the word. life of Yeah, let me not use the word disco because yeah, yeah. aging. <laughs> yeah, the big social life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But what did Uganda do for me? It yeah. actually helped bring me down. A notch. I was very high strung. The sort of work I was doing was very, very high strung. Everybody here was extra polite. Nothing was moving. Quick, quick, quick. I was like, man, I'm not going to make it here. I'm not going to make it here. I need to go to a fast place. I ended up staying here three years and saw what was happening on Talo and was very, very excited. Talo moves to Kenya and I decide this is the time to go. More exploration. I've now left operations, as I've now moved into East Africa, I've left operations, moved into business development for Eastern Africa. And end up in uh, Nairobi, but still looking after the Eastern Africa region. And um, lo and behold, uh, as I said, when you move up, you move up with pe people help you move up. Yeah. I had a big team, senior team, from the Vice President of Sub-Sahara Africa, uh, and other senior leaders who came to our office in Kenya and uh, they pulled me aside and they said, we've been watching you and we'd like to give you an offer. Uh, we'd like you to be our first country manager for Kenya, making you the first country manager in sub-Sahara Africa that's headed by a woman. Wow, that's big. That's something to it's take big. on. It's yeah. big. And I took it. Your dream was almost close to your chest. And I took it. Uh -huh. And I said, here in Kenya, they said, here in Kenya, you'll be based here and you look after East Africa. Now, Elizabeth, hold it right there. We're going to take a break. And when we come back from this break, we want to hear from Elizabeth how the dream that was now close to the chest became a reality. And what can we learn from Elizabeth? Stay right there. We'll be right back after this break. This is the CEO Bench. <music> Welcome back from that break. This is the CEO Bench. My name is Eddie O'Killer, and in the studio is engineer Elizabeth Rogo, all the way from Nairobi, Kenya. Savo Oil Field is where she's based now. But, Elizabeth, welcome to the program. We're going to go back. So, we've been watching you. Yes. And we want to give you the contract. Mm -hmm. What came in your mind first? I was taken aback. Why? Well, um... I didn't see any signs that that was going to happen. These positions or the positions at that time were held by other expatriates and white males. And as I said, there was nobody in sub-Sahara Africa that 
had reached the level at, that I was reaching at in terms of um, operating or running a, a huge operation, okay? So, as I said, when they told me that, I think I'd be lying if I told you I was like, oh, yes, I'm ready here. <laughs> but I was ready. Yeah. Now, let me tell you one yeah. thing. Yeah. I learned from the men. When an opportunity drops on your lap, don't just sit there and question, am I really the right candidate? Yeah. I was confident enough. I said, I've got enough training, and whatever is missing, I will find my way through it, okay? And I've always watched how men navigate it. Is that linked to your upbringing of yes. you always have to ask questions or something? Yes, 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 yes. My mother always was very inquisitive. We'd always have dinner around the table. Questions were being asked, especially on political views. Always taught to be, uh, to have courage to ask. You understand? And uh, not to be afraid, not to feel stupid if the question may seem stupid, all right? So, as I said, it was just a second. Let me say a split second. <laughs> I learned very well from you. I learned very well from you men yes, how, yes. It, how it is. So yes. I grabbed it. Yes. I took the opportunity. But I had confidence in myself. Yeah. I knew I would do it. And I had this weight, felt this weight. Yeah. I am now representing my African sisters from my company. And brothers. And sh uh, yes, and, also, yeah, and brothers too. Yes. And showing them that it could be done. Yeah. Okay? So I took it. And within six months... They came back again, and they now offered me the regional head for all Eastern Africa, from uh, Mozambique all the way to, sorry, from Ethiopia all the way to Mozambique. And I'll tell you, during this period, as much as we were doing oil and gas, there was this energy coming up called geothermal, which yeah. we'll discuss a bit further. Yeah. And I kept telling my people, guys, there's this energy here that's so unique in Eastern Africa, Kenya and Ethiopia at that time was still in its infancy. We must look at this. We must bring our technology into this scope. But like I said, the whole world was oil and gas. So this was now about 2015 thereabouts. The oil market starts. Slump. Yes. And, and for a split second, I'm thinking, okay, have I been set up? Because I'm seeing companies are now shrinking, people are losing jobs, and now here I am. My first task is, where am I taking Eastern Africa? Okay, I've got this workforce, I need to trim it, and this is not what I was ready for. But I did what I had to do. And I'll tell you, when I did this, when I'm doing, this is me, when I remember the HR manager coming from Johannesburg, and telling me, you're the only manager that has sat with their employees when they're being asked to leave. And I said, maybe, again, maybe it's the female in me. There's no other country <laughs> manager. Yes. I said, yeah. th this is, these are, some of these are like my kids. Some of this, this is a family. And I've got to be, I feel their pain. Now, where are they going to next? So, I did a good job in, in making sure and shrinking the East Africa footprint. As I said, people had to go, mainly expatriates. So I'm now left with a very young crew of Kenyans, Mozambicans, Tanzanians, who were supposed to take over jobs of more qualified people. So I gathered them around and I said, guys, sometimes things are not brought the way they're brought on the table. So I'm going to guide you, we'll work together with you, we'll, we'll take you to these jobs that may have been held by your bosses, we will guide you. And I'm happy to see that some of the people that I gave this opportunity to, especially in Mozambique, and mainly the Tanzanians, have gone, gone to different companies and are doing very well in the downstream, like Shell, and they're drilling in different parts of the world. And they've come back to me and thanked me that I gave them that opportunity. Also, I gave them the opportunity to see that an African, not necessarily even a woman, an African can actually sit in some of these um, positions. And I'm just talking about the company that I, I was with. Now, during this time, as I'm taking on the leadership roles, even as a business development manager, all this stuff, I started thinking to myself, if I can do this for uh, um, a company, 
why can't I do this for a company that I have envisioned that should come out and look a bit different from where I'm sitting? That is where I want to come in. Yes. That thinking right there, would you attribute that to your leadership abilities that defined your level of effectiveness? Or would you say your level of effectiveness in that job at this point now define your leadership abilities to think that way? Good question. Um, I had to think as a leader because I think the, f the effectiveness was there. So the thing was now I've got to think as a leader because if I'm going to start this company, I have nobody else to look to turn to. So do I have that leadership skill? Do I have that skill to be able to s step out and say, I'm going to start something? Now, I did approach the company that I was working with and said, look, I've got a proposal for you that maybe if I, we can partner, you can go off and do your, your stuff. We can minimize your costs. I am here, but I'm all about also educating the Kenyans and mainly the East Africans, okay? Or the East Africans and mainly the Kenyans. What, what about a minute, uh, Elizabeth? At that point, had you now stepped down when you're approaching the same company you were? Not yet. I had not yet stepped down. You, you're trying no, to no, create because now I'm within looking, when you are yes, still... Yes, correct. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the numbers. Yes. And I'm looking at what is happening around me. Yeah. I'm seeing bases are closing. And, and I'm seeing East Africa, even though it's not in Nigeria, because all the emphasis was in Gabon, Nigeria, Congo. I'm saying this East Africa is a diamond in the rough. If I don't speak out, they can easily just close it down and move on. Uh, you understand? So it was, it was me uh, as, a, as a leader, then as regional head. I felt it was my mission to tell the folks in Houston and Johannesburg, guys, don't leave this place. Then I started thinking, how can I do things differently without the constraints of corporate America? And I I tell people this, and, and some may think I'm joking, but I had a dream. Tell me and, about it. And that dream, I would <laughs> say, God spoke to me and said, you are going to form a company. And I said, doing what? Saying, doing exactly what you're doing in a different way. OK, what's the name of the company? Don't worry. You will figure it out. All I could see was a blank, you know, I said, well, am I even ready for that? He said, yes, you're ready. So I said, what is my mission? Your mission is to remain right where you are and create everything that you have learned, all the experiences that you have had are all crystallizing to this very point. I woke up and I went to my lawyer and I said, I have to open a company. Elizabeth, was this an actual dream? Yes, it was an actual dream. I have to open a company. What the hell am I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> I have mean, not owned a company. Yes. You've been working for people since you left the university. Yes, correct. All right. But another motivation. I looked around. Again, I'm not seeing, okay, I've, I've reached this pinnacle here. But I dared myself. I want to be president of an energy company. Do I have the time to do it where I'm sitting? You look at all, everybody above you. You've got to go to Houston. Does anyone like me even sit in those positions? And I said, no. Nah. Let me use my time wisely. That is when Savo Oil Field Services okay. was, was formed. And that was in 2017. June of 2017. I started it in my living room, and the rest is history. Now, what was I envisioning? I envisioned a company where I would have a lot of, or able to impact um, technical Kenyans. Because I remember when I used to drive those roads of Texas, Oklahoma, and I said, well, I don't have somebody that looks like me. Yes, I have beautiful mentors, but nobody looked like me in the space that I was, and especially women. I was the only woman doing what I was doing in many, many circumstances. And I said, this cannot be, I cannot be an anomaly. 
Okay. <laughs> so I said, okay. Yeah. Let me start this. Mm. University of, or Kenyatta University. Somehow, I don't know, can't remember, they had opened a brand new uh, petroleum engineering school. And somehow the dean and myself got together. And uh, their first, uh, before they became graduates, I got two interns from them. And I said, guys, the only way we're going to start getting anything here is we, we do what we call tenders. We're going to start tendering for jobs. If you want to do, get work with tallow oil, you have to tender. If you want to work for government, you have to tender. Do you know what it means to tender? And these two young men looked at me and I could see in their eyes that like, this is not what we signed up for. You threw them in the deep end. I threw them in the deep end. And you know what? Yeah. I keep throwing them in the deep end. That formula has worked for me. Okay. Let's throw in the deep end. You have yes. to swim from there. Correct. Sharks infested waters. Correct. If you survive, yes. you're going to survive. Correct. Wow. Yes. Elizabeth, before we take another break, all these stories and all this energy behind you, would you term it as a woman who realized that if my mother did it, I can do it. Yes. Was that energy around her? Was the things that talk about her, you know, a motivation, motivating factor for you to go into this thing and say, let me go here? And if yes, what would then, what would you then define change management to be? And how can we manage that change? Because possibly, uh, you know, rather, it's not very possible for most people to do it easily. And change management is not something that comes very easy to people. But you started to manage change when things were happening. You could see it and you say to have a discussion within your company and saying, hey, wait a minute, guys, they might close East Africa down or shut it down completely. Just before the light is shined on my side, let me go and shine the light there. That's what you did. Yeah. I think um, it's very important to have a few cheerleaders around you. And as I said, my sisters and my mother particularly were my cheerleaders, okay? The inner core. And uh, there'll be times you'll doubt yourself. Nobody, you will. We're all human beings. But I always would draw the inspiration from my mother because even the stuff that she used to do, she was doing things when a lot of women were not doing it. She was a first, as you mentioned, she was the, actually the first African woman in the East Africa Safari Rally, which was the toughest at the time. This is 19, 1974. A young girl, a young girl at that time, or a young lady, sorry, at that time, what motivated her? What did she know about Safari Rally? You understand? So I, 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 I take energy from that. What did I know about oil and gas? Nobody, nobody told me. What, what did I know about energy? So I took that. I said, if you're going to go into this field, you've got to, you've got to own it. You've got to breathe it. You've got to live it. I, but as you're doing that, always remember to bring people with you. It cannot be a, a journey, a lone journey. Because I always believe that when you finish that journey, you must have a huge mass of people behind <laughs> you. I always tell people, yes. I always tell people, I don't want to be morbid here. Yeah. I always tell people that the people that will bury me are the, are the people behind me, the people that I brought up, the people that I showed the way. Some may not see it. And I tell them, at this time, you may not see what I'm trying to show you, yeah. but maybe one day you'll see it. And some may even see it and say, that's all I was looking for. What do I need from this lady? Yeah. And they will never appreciate the Correct. background of where Correct. they have come Correct. from. Yes. But you, you, that's life. Yeah. You, you move on. You don't take that, you don't take that personally. Okay. You know? Yeah. We're going to take... But, yes. Go on. No, I think you, the question you're asking me about was uh, change, change yeah, management. Yeah. And I'll tell you, you must have people, uh, people around you. I said um, change management can come any time. What I'm saying is you need to be prepared. Because some, some entries into certain journeys, if you don't take it at the time it presents itself, if you're still fiddling, it goes and it'll go forever. 
or if you get it, it is not what it could have been. Do you understand? Yeah. And I'm not saying that everything you jump into may necessarily be the right thing. Yeah. You, you also, there could be mistakes. Even in the, some of the stuff I did, there were some um, mistakes that I made. But what is the important lesson that we know? If you fall flat or if you fall on your face, you get up. That is what's important. We'll take another break, Elizabeth. Yes. And when we come back, we'll carry on from the change management points. Is change actually good for us or is not? Some people fear mm-hmm. change because change can change everything and mess up everything or can make everything good. This is the CEO Bench. My name is Eddie O'Killer, Elizabeth Rogo in the studio here. The CEO Bench will take a break and when we come back, we'll be talking to Elizabeth about change management. Is change actually good or we should just not change anything? Mm-hmm. 